Awesome. So, thank you for coming to uh, Data Masters, our meetup event. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about Cassandra, uh, which is a NoSQL data storage system. Uh, first, I just want to give a, a few notes, a few uh, you know, introductions. First, I want a special thanks to Rocket Labs for giving us the space, so big hand for you. And it's super helpful to Charles uh, uh, Walter and Charles Yerzara. They've been super, super helpful in helping us put this together, getting it announced, getting the word out, giving us the space, using their TV, all that stuff. Uh, so very, very appreciative for that. Uh, it's really awesome to be here down in Miami Beach, right smack in the middle of like Starkville. So I also want to give thanks to Ranger Tech, uh, John Giovanni and Brian Nunez. Brian is here, right there from Ranger Tech. They are our sponsor. So they give us money for food and the And then I am the organizer. My name is Andrew Simkowski. Uh, we are uh, roughly, I don't know exactly which day, I have to go look it up, but basically we are, Data Masters is now one year old. So this is our 12th, uh, 12th uh, year. So we started a year ago, we now have over 100 registered members. We have a couple of people that show up every single one. Like Nicholas is here every single time. So thank you for that, I appreciate that. Uh, but we're growing, so this is pretty awesome. Uh, quick file about me, I've been working for about 15 years in database technology. Uh, I've worked in pretty much every platform you can think of, Oracle, MySQL, uh, SQL Server, Postgres, all the NoSQL stuff now, Couchbase, uh, Redis, now Cassandra, the Neo4j. Uh, I've worked across just about every industry you can think of, from consulting, telecom, energy, uh, online gaming, now I'm working in healthcare. So. Uh, across all the, the data industries, which is pretty interesting because every industry needs data, uh, but every industry does it differently. And when you work across those industries, you get the benefit of seeing how each industry does it slightly differently. Uh, each one has different needs, each one has different scaling requirements, so it gives you a great depth of knowledge across the board. Our guest speaker tonight, uh, oh, sorry, one more slide. Uh, so, uh, my website, dbtechpro, uh, dbtechpro.com is the website, that's my blog. I'm, after the meetup event, I'll be posting the video, the slides, and any other pictures on that website, so you can get them there. Uh, I'll also be sending out emails and information. I'll also post pictures on meetup.com. So if you want the, uh, the notes uh, from the demonstration, the slides, you can go to that website and get them. There's also a technical forums on that website, so if you have technical questions, you can post them there, and I'll get to answer them for you. Uh, and my, uh, my email, Andrew at dbtechpro.com, and my Twitter, at uh, ASIMCUSP. You can remember how to spell that. <laughs> so. Our guest speaker tonight is Marcelo Olivas, right here. Woo! 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 So, Woo! He, is, uh, he is an architect from 3C Interactive. He works with Cassandra on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, he's been working in Miami since 1998, and he went to school here. So he's pretty much my Miami bred by this point. Yeah. So, uh, currently working at 3C Interactive, he's been working with Cassandra for quite a while now. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to him, Marcelo, welcome, and thank you for being a guest speaker. Thank you. So let's go ahead and get started. Awesome. Thank you guys. So, let me get this guy here. Um, Alright, so again, I'm going to talk about Cassandra, that's my name, Marcelo Livas. Um, that's my Twitter, as well as Skype, as well as uh, Gmail. So you can so you can reach me there. Um, before I start, uh, just so you guys know, the one thing that I always tell people is that um, the way that I, I'm going to start everything is I'm going to have this much attention from everybody. And eventually, you know, we want to check our Twitter, check the kids, work, and stuff like that. So then I'm going to have this much. Then towards the very end, I'm probably going to have this. So just keep that in mind when we do. Uh, but before we end up starting with Cassandra, I always would like to start with uh, the with what. Um, one of the things that we're talking to Charles and as well as Brian is that a lot of people, a lot of companies, usually what they do is that they just start using an application and never like to forget. They're just going to start using that for everything. And the one thing that I want to uh, get out from the presentation is the strength or you know, why should you consider using Cassandra? What is the strength, but also what are the weaknesses? Where the product you shouldn't be using this. Um, and the best way that I can that I can convey when to use Cassandra is probably in, in my case was when we started working with the mobile with Guillermo, 
the one thing that we end up doing is we end up getting a lot of, a lot of rights. Um, and then eventually, if we wanted to add, uh, we wanted to add a, a column and an index, and it just took forever. It was just brutal, and it was just too much rights. And the other thing that I was having problem with is um, I was also um, previously I worked at bank, and in the bank we have this disaster recovery policy, and the policy was we are going to have these hot servers that are going to be here, and then we're going to have these quote unquote warm servers that are going to be on the other side. And eventually, once a year, we try to do the scenario of like, oh, you know, there's a huge tornado or something like that, or a hurricane. So now we're going to switch over everything. It never worked. It never worked. And that's pretty much where Cassandra comes in. The one thing that you get with Cassandra, right, is linear scalability. You know, meaning that you ought to know no go. You know, you, you automatically scale that way. That the other thing is that you get real time multi data center support. Meaning, if you have a data center that is, you know, East Coast New York and you have another one in California, you can actually create, bake in the replication to say, hey, um, I want to have a replication here in New York at the same time, too. I want to persist a couple of other servers over there in, um, in, in, in California. The other thing that you have is because it's a truly, uh, it is truly a distributed database, and that's the one thing that it took me took me a while to get. The fact that it's completely distributed, and you know you have replicas everywhere, you have this fix it on Monday problem, of course. This happens, as we just said. You know, the one thing that you get is the fact that you have highly distributed. A lot of people said, you know what, I know that the node is down, but I'll I'll go ahead and fix it on Monday. I need to fix it right now because there's all the replicas. Um, before we get started, right, I want to make sure that to tell you that the one thing that I have with Cassandra, the biggest challenge that I have is the paradigm shift. You know, my background has always been with databases. My first language was actually PLC. Right, so my background, I have a soft spot in my mind for databases. So I'm, I'm very glad that I understood this meetup. Um, however, you know, I, I mean, Pretty much, I understand databases, I understand the relational model, right? I understand all the different patterns. And once I started with Cassandra, I realized that everything was wrong. Everything is actually not that pattern. Things, for example, like normalization, that's actually not that pattern for Cassandra. The way that they end up doing indexes is actually different, totally different. The way that, you know, the whole notion about, um, you have a master and a slave, that does not exist in Cassandra. It's truly, truly distributed. But like I said, it's, it's different, different mindsets, a different paradigm. Um, so because of that, I usually try to start with the data model. So if we start the very basic of, uh, of Cassandra, you end up having a column. And a column is composed of three things. First is a key, a value, and a timestamp. That composes a column. And that for me is kind of different, right? Because if you're thinking about the relational database, you think, okay, a column is this beautiful thing that has like a name and then I put values in there. It's not this. Um, so, and then again, it's just a basically a key value pair with the timestamp. We'll talk about a little bit more what is the time, time, time stamp used for. But that itself is what a column is. Totally different. Okay? And then row, it's also different. A row actually can have multiple set of columns. Again, you can have, for example, the key, the value, right? And then all that together composes, along with the row key, composes a row. And the other thing is that you see this row key, we'll go over there and take a look at it a little bit more once we end up seeing that cluster and how the token ring ends up working. That it's actually a way of partitioning inside the application. This is something also that is kind of different with Cassandra. Um, in relational database, right? You write something and it's replicated within the entire database. And now with Cassandra, Cassandra instead, you have different different nodes and some of those nodes hold different values. So this is the way that you know where that data is going to be reside is basically on the road. So again, all these guys, basically a bunch of columns with a row key as a row. 
And the other thing is that rho is a set of four columns. Remember that, remember that timestamp? That's very important there. Um, the other thing that we have is column family. And column family is just a bunch of rows all put together. As you can tell, some of them are stagnant. So in other words, it's a schema less. And again, you know, that is composed of a common family. Um, the one thing that I also end up understanding when, the, when I was dealing with Cassandra is you end up having two sort of like common families. The common families are almost like tables or relational databases. And you have what we call static common families, right? Which is very similar to what we do right now, like entities. You have Google, you have last price. Um, like the, the closing price, and then the name. This is something that we, we're used to, right? We, we know what these are, entities, we know, we understand. Where Cassandra itself is on the dynamic column family, especially what we call the time series uh, uh, columns. Uh, in here, uh, notice that I have pre materialized squares. This is something that uh, Ryan and I were talking you have to actually think of how you're going to do your queries. And that's how you build your data model. Again, it's very different of how we do with databases nowadays, right? Before, you have a table, and you basically start normalizing stuff, right? You start creating nouns, employees, right? Department, all that stuff. And then you start, you know, basically normalizing all this stuff, in other words. You want to make sure that the data is not duplicated. Now with Cassandra. Over here, as you notice, you have Google, and then you have all the different, all the different times of the closing, of, of the closing price. Um, uh, and, and you, like I said, you store it as you read. And it comes down to set of portable rows again. Uh, something that what we can call sort of like a database or, or a schema in Oracle is called a, a key space. Um, and a cluster is just a set of uh, key spaces. Um, so that is like the basics of the data model. The one thing is, again, you know, uh, the column families are not tables. They kind of are, but the way that I always tell people is like, before you used to read it like this, and with Cassandra, sort of like you switched it. Um, they can be wide. And they can be narrow, wide in the sense of like, you know, time series. They can be just really big. But you can also do entities, right? Especially for configuration policies, it's awesome too. So in other words, if you want to have, like for example, here, right now I'm dealing with an application called direct carrier building. And then direct carrier building is, um, in a way, we're going we're gonna to have an application that connects directly with all the carriers that we have, Verizon, T-Mobile, all the apps. And the one thing that um, we need is the metadata how we communicate to them. That stuff is basically an entity. So it's small, it's compacted, it's small, and it's not big. However, the white um, column families is, for example, the time series. All that communication that is going back and forth with the carriers and the clients, that is basically stored in a time series, so it's pretty wide. Uh, you don't have any joints. There's something else that you have. There's no joints. Um, as a matter of fact, if you, you're saying, wait, so what happens if I want to have a subset of this stuff? Like, let's say, for example, I have this direct carrier billing when you're doing this, this small little dance here with, with the carriers. What if I want to sort of like unite it with my other databases for my CRM? We say just duplicate it. You know, the dirty little secret about databases, so you will see that once you end up getting with performance, you actually denormalize data. With Cassandra, it's just like, yep. You want to do that then? Just start now. Um, you only get one index. I put a little asterisk there because you do support secondary indexes. But they're kind of different, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. Secondary index, you can index any column in there, but they are mostly for low cardinality. Um, when, when I say uh, low cardinality, is if you want to go to the relational database, if you think about an index, you have many things. Oh, primary key it has to be unique, right? Usually, if you're using MySQL, is most likely it's going to be like a, an increment number that makes this unique, right? So, 
In, in Cassandra, it's actually different. You actually want a low cardinality. In low cardinality means that you actually want to have something that, for example, will use your name. They will be repeated, and that's completely okay. Because of the way that the way that they do it is almost like a reverse index. Um, and that's something, like I said, is totally different from this. It's, it's still well supported, but like I said, it's just a different paradigm. The other thing that I want to talk about is a different pattern that I seen that I used at the moment. I would talk about the entity. You can definitely have you know, an employee. We hope we have um, you know column company as index, which basically we talk about as a secondary index. Then after that, the material that's used, which is something that we end up using a lot on the on, on the data warehouse world. You end up doing materialized view, and we talk a little bit more time series, which is where Cassandra just basically kick ass. The one thing that we're using it in uh, 3CI is we're using it for our logging framework. Um, this huge amount of data that is coming through from different systems. And the one thing that we want to do is just getting into this big pool, and then eventually product mine them in some type of, uh, you know, some type of algos, maybe some, some, some type of, uh, you know, machine learning or anything like that that can probably help us with the clients and provide value to the clients. But all this stuff, all these events, they have to be saved according to times. And so that's what the whole dynamic thing comes in. And event sourcing, which is something that um, Martin Fogler came in. And, and it announced that there was, a, there was this guy, I think his name is Nate Mars. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him. He's the guy that ended up creating Storm Twitter. Storm. Right. So um, this guy actually was the one that gave me the idea that turned me into Cassandra. The one thing that I always used to do, right, and um, is this is for example if Marcelo lives in South Beach, right, and all of a sudden he goes to Kendall. What do you do if you're in a relational database? You just update. You know, Marcelo now lives in Kendall. Um, what he suggested in his book, and, and it makes total sense, is just don't don't worry about that. Just have a timestamp. So you have those two records there. And the one that derives, which is the last one to show, is the timestamp. So you have sort of like this immutable rows that you have. And the only thing that derives them is in the timestamp. There's a lot of, it's a really good book. Um, again, it's called Big Data. Called, uh, there's another thing that he talked about with Brian. I, I told him Lambda stack. It's, it's just really good. Yeah. Anyways, that's. My shameless book. The other thing that I have is I have a I'm a bookworm, and uh, so I, I end up reading a lot. Uh, Many when 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 I don't talk to either Eric or Bernie about this. So let's go with entities. This is the first one. This is something that we know. It's something that you know we, we already know when when it's when is an entity, right? Um, single private, you have a primary key, you have, you know, for example, like users, right? Then narrow, feels like a relational database, still schema and stuff. Um, common family as yes, index, it's like I mentioned to you, it's like a secondary index. Um, you have, uh, the way the way that you end up doing in Cassandra, which a lot of the NoSQL um, applications end up doing is that sometimes, you know, your foreign keys is almost like, is it's almost like explicit foreign keys, right? You actually have the foreign key, right? But then your application has to be the one that does the fetching of the other records. So let's say, for example, if you have employees and you have departments, right? Maybe you just have the ID of departments. Now your application is the one that has to be in charge of like, okay, I have to be the one picking up that other, that, that record based on this ID. Online relational database that you already have that foreign key attached to it, so the results that is attached. So every time you know you do a query on on, on employees and departments, that foreign key you know goes over there, locks this guy, basically finds the ID, comes back and pulls its play. Um, the biggest problem that you have with that is how you right again updates, you know locking. Um, it's very very hard in this period system. Um, locking is something that is just really, really hard in this period system because you have this humongous cluster and then all of a sudden you want to say, okay, I need consistency. So everybody, I'm going to update this. Everybody stop. I've got to update it. 
as 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 now. So that's again some of, some of the trade off that you get with Cassandra. Um, materialized views is something that we do also in the data warehouse world. And like I mentioned, if you have all these employees, all these uh, departments, and you want to combine them, then what you do is you basically aggregate these two guys or, or the view or the view that you want, and you just put it in the column. That's basically what it is. Time series is something that we're doing a lot, and we'll show an example in a little bit. In the time series, you have a row key, which is actually a time identifier. The fact is, again, the row key, keep in mind that that's like a set of file for the partition. And so what you, want, what you don't want to do is create these things that are called hotspots. So imagine, and we're probably going to show it, it's probably better in my animations. But the one thing that you want to do is basically spread all those records, sort of like distributed among the cluster, even. So the one thing that you do is, for example, end up using a time series that, for example, like the, the hour and the minute. You have a lot of transactions. Previously, I was working in a, in a stock trade. So we used to get like about 4,000 messages per second. And the one thing that we used to do is just like, that was like an advantage. And the one thing that um, that I used to, I, I learned really quick, is during the opening of the market and the closing of the market, you get these really big spikes, right? So one of the things that we end up doing is, you know, we end up doing time series, but we end up noticing that, okay, for those spikes, we're going to distribute it even more. So like that, we don't have hot spots for that particular But for that particular time, we say, for example, 9 a.m., we're not going to have this cluster that is like bombarded with a bunch of stuff. And at 4 p.m., we're not going to have also this cluster which is bombarded with a bunch of stuff. Um, I'll show it, I'll show some animations. Event sourcing, this is something uh, more on Fowler's idea, which is basically what Nate Mars ended up talking about. Um, just again, you know, you update, you end up having a Marcelo, and he's, he lives in South Beach, but now he lives in, in Kendall. So the one thing that you do is basically everything is derived at the time. So if, if something happens bad, if something, something, something happened, what you can do is you can replay all these events and find out exactly what happens. You never delete. So that was something that I, I thought it was pretty cool. Also, because I'm becoming more like a mutable junkie, and I, I ended up really liking uh, Scala. Any functional programmers here? Uh, yeah. Fuck. Wow. <laughs> 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 no, I, I gotta spread the love to Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you have a CQL, which is a Cassandra query language. Mainly, it's because we really miss our old friends, right? We, we, we know what SQL is. If you say, do select start from employees, we all know exactly what that means. So with CQL, you get it, right? Um, really quick, over here, just, just so I know my audience. Uh, how many of you guys are developers? So, system engineers? Nice. Architects. Sweet. Project managers? Did I miss anyone? Managers. Okay. Database guys. Database guys. <laughs> yes. So I'm a Java guy. I don't know. Any Java dudes here? Love it. Love it. Um, Dynet? You? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> so this one is basically covering the JDBC drivers. It, it is basically like that. You know, there's a lot of people that uh, support um, Cassandra, um, mainly uh, data stacks. Um, also, Netflix is, the, is basically the poster child of, of Cassandra. Um, and they have their own drivers, it's called Dynex. Um, the, there's a lot of, the community is pretty awesome. Um, that's actually the, the one thing that ended up driving me into it. When uh, I end up starting in Cassandra, I just end up writing something in, uh, in Twitter saying, dude, you know what? I really want to know. I want. I really want to learn Cassandra. And then the guy wrote back to me and said, like, "Dude, can I help you with anything?" And I was like, uh, "Yeah, I don't know where to start." He's like, oh, "Get into IRC, dude, and look for me." And I was like, oh. "And later down the line, I found out that the guy is actually the uh, the main developer. And at that moment in time, he was in Apigee. Now he started his own company. Now he's, he's called the Last Pickle. 
but anyway, um, and, uh, anyways, he's, he was the one that created Hector, the, 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 the driver for, 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 for Cassandra at that time. Um, but anyways, really cool guy. Um, as, you can tell, as you can tell over here, it's pretty straightforward, right? You got the name for the driver, you know, the connection, and then you just update it, and then that's it. You don't have to say, hey, you know, which one's the master? Which was the slave? You know, how, much, how big is your cluster? Can I connect to anything there? Actually, yeah. Um, and again, you know, you notice that update, that's actually secure. Um, creating a key space. We'll talk about a, a little bit more about this different simple strategy. But that's basically saying, hey, I want to create a key space for Able. This is a master class with strategy, simple strategy. And that right there is telling me about their replication. And we'll talk about the, uh, the replication in a minute. Uh, same thing with the uh, create file values. You know, um, you can put comments, the big repairs, all the metadata that's in there. Big thing is the uh, timestamp automatic. Yeah, the timestamp, and you will see a little bit, the one thing that you deal with is actually with delicious. And you will see that in there. The timestamp, you cannot access it. It's actually used by the system. And we'll see a bit. Because the one thing, remember that I mentioned that it's portable? You'll see why, especially in the replications and the collision factor. That's, that's where it's going to come time to play. Same thing with the rights. You know, the one thing that you have to remember, Cassandra is an append only database. You do inserts, you do updates, you can even do deletes. They're all inserts. That's it. The only thing that changes is the timestamp. When I said even the delete, at the very beginning I was like, what do you mean the delete? It's an insert. Yeah, it's actually a marker. You put a marker there. They call it tombstone. Um, so that's, that's how you know. You say, hey, you know what? I'm going to delete this guy. Awesome. Well, put something here so it's going to say, hey, this guy's delete. So the next time you query, you're going to see a marker saying, actually, this guy's gone. Okay. Um, is it really gone? I'm sorry? Is it really gone or is it always successful? No, it's actually, the, the, everything is immutable. The only thing that the marker is going to say is a tombstone. Eventually, once you end up going to the, what, where Cassandra ends up working is, so you end up getting all the rights, and then eventually you delete something, and then it sits into this box, right? And eventually, through compression into the read repair, it starts deleting stuff. And that's something that is also kind of bad with Cassandra. You don't want to do a lot of deletes. If your system is doing a lot of deletes, it might be not a good system. We'll go over there and go into an example, but just think about it like this. So you have a cluster, right? A lot of guys. This is, for example, you start deleting a bunch of stuff. Um, but one of the nodes, before you start deleting, one of the nodes went down. Just completely went down. Went down. There's something called a handoff that the moment that you see this guy going out because the replication factor, the nodes are saying, hey, that guy is down, so I'm going to hold all these states that's supposed to go to that node, and I'm just going to hold them in here. Temporary, right? Where there's a time to live. So imagine this now. This is, for example, a day went by. And actually took over. So all those tombstones, they actually get deleted. They truly get deleted at the moment in time through compaction. Now that note comes back up, what happens? This guy says, guys, I'm alive, and I have all these things. You guys need to replicate. That's bad, right? So that's when I tell people, if you have to do a lot of leads, it, it might not be the best, the best system. Um, same thing with the leads, you can tell us. Pretty, like I said, all these guys, all the consistency one, you will see all this stuff in there as well as once we end up talking about the replication and how you fetch. Um, the scaling is a dynamo style distributed hash uh, table. So the way that this ends up working, right? Um, if anyone has seen the paper from Dynamo, uh, it's from Amazon. Amazon created this dynamo database, right? And uh, it's a mashup between Dynamo and Big Data from Google. The people that actually started using it was actually Facebook. Facebook actually was the one that started Cassandra. But then after that, it's been, uh, it's 
there's been a lot of changes in the community. So the one thing that I want to talk about is the cluster, which is basically a hash ring. Um, best way that I've been able to introduce uh, the hash ring is through a, through a series of, 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 of drawings, actually. So I figured that I can try to do the best over here. So imagine that this is your cluster. This is what a token ring looks like, right? And the way that, just think about it for a little bit like this. Every time I try to save something, right, this guy holds a range. So let's say, for example, from 0 to 2,000, this guy is going to hold. That's the range that he will hold. From 2,000 to, 4, uh, 2000 to 400, he's going to hold that. Right? So let's say, for example, let's say if you have these two guys, 3D97 angry, right? Once persisted, he will go, will go there, right? Because clearly, he holds that range between those two guys, right? And the same thing with 9, C4F, this guy will go here because he holds that range, right? And so that is, let's say, for example, if you want to get access to this guy, you know where, to, where you have to go. You will have to go there. Because that's for it to exist. And then eventually, as you can imagine, all these guys are known, right? And the way that this guy works, this is just getting into the weeds in here. The way that this guy's known, if everything is working fine, who's supposed to have what, is through a series of, series of protocols. Um, one of them is called gossip. So gossip really ended up finding out, hey, you know, how is 4,000 doing? To the past, dude. It's doing a lot of rides and stuff like that. 2000, eh. So, as you can imagine, every second on the second, this cost starts talking to the other nodes. So, there's truly, you know, all these guys, because of, of the gossip, know exactly what's going on within the entire cluster. Um, so, yeah, it would, if you fetch this guy here, you will get angry. And the same thing with here. This is, for example, if you go for this guy, you know where to get him, and then you will get him. Um, I want to talk a little bit about replication. Right? In the replication, you get a uh, replication factor of n. Default is 1. Here you need 1, 1, 1. Right? So in case something happens, you know you have that replication somewhere else. Um, here, replica plays this variety. There's, there's more than this in here. The only thing that I'm going to talk about is a simple strategy and the network topology strategy, which is the one we use. And that is because um, we have uh, different data centers and like uh, different geographical locations. And so we want to replicate not only among um, four data centers, right, but also across different data centers. Um, in the simple strategy, so imagine that your strategy is to you know, replicate in three. So the one, the one thing that you end up using is that this guy will go to the 4,000, and then uh, clockwise, you end up replicating that guy to three. So that's a minute. So think about this, right? Because of the fact that you have this replica, in reality, this guy knows the state of all these guys. Just like this guy knows the state of all these guys. So that's something that was really cool. And then again, the network topology over here, the moment that you end up monkey, right? You will go here, there, and also two. So imagine here, there's a replication factor of two, but also you have the notion of two data centers. Um, and this doesn't have to be data centers. The one thing that I tell people, it could be like actually separated racks. You know what I mean? So like you have two racks in here, and um, and then at, at, at the same time, you can replicate it in these two guys. And all of that is already baked in. You know, there's, the only thing that you have to do is configure that in space, or even configure that in intent. It says, hey, you know what? I want to input topology, and this is the replication factor there. Um, I do mean to say that if you're using a client, every node know, knows something about that. So if you go to a client, right, if you're looking for this guy, you can actually access any one of these nodes. This is, for example, this guy. He wants to do for 3D97. And because of the cost of protocol, it would be like, dude, I know exactly what you need to go to this guy. 
right? And so automatically they know us, they know their state, they know where to go. Right? It's truly the distributed database in that sense. There's no there's no, there's no notion of master slave, which is something compelling. Um, for example, that's one of the things that we had with, with MySQL. Um, when it comes to the right replicas, same thing, you know, hey, I want to save this guy, fine, we need to go here, same thing. But imagine over here, other, um, let's say for example here, I want a replica of, of, of three, so automatically I will write it to this guy and write it to the other three. Um, I want to talk about like the hinted handout, but kind of like went over that briefly. And that's what happens if one of the nodes is down, right? I said, for example, my client, I'm looking for this 14C7. The 14C7 is, is there, but it's completely down. At that moment in time, the application knows, okay, I still got to, I, I got to, I got to replicate this into the other nodes, right? But I know that this guy is down. At that moment in time, the application will go ahead and have this, this thing called the coordinator stores in him, and the coordinator is the guy that is in charge of the replica. I know that coordinator sounds like a master, but everyone can be the coordinator. It's just wherever the client says, hey, I need to send this guy to all these three guys. So he says, okay, I'm gonna take the role of the coordinator, I'm gonna send him. So at that moment in time, as you, as you notice, this guy is completely down, so what he does, he, he saved the state. A000, save that state until this guy comes back to life, right? And then does the replica with the other two guys. Once that guy comes back alive, they will send him the stuff. And that's the problem that I end up having in my cluster. Just remember that I tried to delete too many, and then all of a sudden when they came back up, the one that was down was like, oh, look at me, and I have all this stuff. And then replicate. Um, Right, consistency, any one form of, I highly recommend forum, and I highly recommend using the hand and out, just because it helps you out, it really does. Forum, that's basically saying that if you have three nodes, you're gonna store into it. So it's half just one thing for everyone. Reading data, this is where basically the time kind of goes. Reading data, let's say for example, then you have a factor of three, right? This is an event of consistency, right? So eventually you have to find out if there's any type of collision. And this is where the time, the newest one will win. And here, for example, I go to this client, the client says, do you need to go over here to? He said, fine, give me that guy. And he will say, ah, oh, this guy has more data, good sweet, but I have a replication of three, so I need to get some more, awesome. Here you go. And I get to the other one. Perfect. And if you notice, the timestamp is today, so we're great. So we go, let's go to check the three replicas. Yeah. Depends on the replication factor that you have. Yeah, the, the, the end replication factor. Exactly. How does it matter the latency of the replicas? It does. And that's something that you can do. It's really up to you. You know, that's one of the things that you have with Cassandra, is you can have tuning consistency. So maybe you do want to have more than three, but maybe you just want to one. You know? But yes, that's a trade-off. Um, but imagine the other scenario, right? Let's say you come over here, you end up getting a monkey with today's date, and then you get over here, and you beat yesterday's date, and then the other one, which is today. In there, you notice that there is a conflict, right? This is inconsistent. So there, you basically have to tell them, hey, you guys need to sort that out, or you do something in your application to, to fix that. How, you, how, how could you get that kind of consistency? You, get it, you have the, the gossip algorithm, what's the coordinator? Right, imagine, man, even like, one of the examples is imagine one of the nodes go down, mm -hmm. and then it comes back up. Still not synced in, so you have to let it, you know, probably like the gossips have been coordinated with it, and that's what we will do. That's a, a, a case where several several steps of the scenario are being produced at the same time. 
Um, the brief consistency is again third. Brief consistency, same thing. You can get one form, which is you know half plus one for all. And the only way that I can think of, of all this, you know, if uh, if you really need to make sure that everything is fine, which is a huge latency problem that you have, especially if you want to do it across data centers. Um, but it's valid. I say the way that I can tell people is again fluent, right? Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is, is regarding the, the storage model. Uh, every time you end up uh, writing something, right? Every time that you end up writing something, this is the way that you go. There's a commit log, a mem table, and SS table. Every time you go into Cassandra, when you say, when I, when I want the replica, that means that at least I want to write it into disk. You know, once I write it into disk, into this, in this commit log, I'm fine. Then Cassandra is going to take over. This is when it comes to the writes. Right? So imagine that if you want to end up persisting something, you say, hey, I'm going to put it into the, into, into the commit log. Once I put it into the commit log, it puts it into the mem table, which is, as you can imagine, this is a memory. And then eventually, once the memory gets big, it flushes it into an SS table. And then the SS table, this is where you know the compaction happens, right? Because all these guys are basically getting appended. And then eventually in the compaction, it says, okay, I just need the last one. I don't need all these big I just need the last one. Right? And now so the compaction is when it happens of like, hey, I have a tombstone over here, find this thing. Right? It does all that. Um, but if you're using the, the, the linear story, mm -hmm. like I do right away, okay, the, uh, of the story records, if you go into a compaction, maybe it's a part of your story. Right, every time it goes to compaction, so for example, if you delete, you, you remember that you said Yeah, that, that, that's what this the tomb stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about if you have a, a record of history that you're you keeping about this time, that time stamps. Yeah. That's what is compact and delete some part of it. No. Well, it only, it only deletes. Let's say, for example, if you have, um, it only deletes if it, they're sort of like, for example, like you do updates. Right? It, they're both inserts. And the, only, the only thing that you're saying is like, oh, this guy just, it just changed the state, so we just want to keep the last one. And that's what he does. Yeah. But, but the, in, the, in the time series, it doesn't. Because in that moment in time, they're all spread within the cluster. And, and in reality, because of the fact that the key now is totally different, the compaction doesn't keep it. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is remember that when we talk about the hash rank, the one thing that you can have, just as you can imagine, is what a lot of people call hotspots. Uh, this is something that we'll talk with Brian a bit. And hotspots means that one cluster probably can have like, a lot of data, right? So let's say, for example, if uh, the only thing that I can think of is um, stop trading. So then stop trading, let's say, for example, you are uh, you're doing some type of time series and you say, hey, you know what, I'm going to just store it in all these different ticker symbols according to the hour. But as I mentioned, there's some peak hours. Like, clearly, there's going to be peaks within the trade. So, for example, if uh, something big happened to Apple, right? So, you know that that's going to create a spike. But also, you always know that there's these spikes that happen when you during the open of the market and closing of the market. Those are considered hot spots. So, a lot of people what they used to do is, as you mentioned, if you have a, a hash rate, right? What you would do is like, okay, this guy is getting a lot of load. Let's partition this guy a little bit more. So you put another poster there, and then you said, okay, now separate these guys. Instead, like that, you don't have, you don't, you don't have a storage. And that's that's probably for balancing the, the the hash rate. Anyhow, but then the one thing that, that a lot of people end up end, end up having is that you know what? I really don't like the fact that everything is sort of like an apartment. Like this guy is just grabbing all this bunch of stuff. 
can we split it into smaller chunks? And now they end up doing that. And there, now there's a partition, for example. Now you can have one guy having a whole bunch of stuff in there. So as you remember the partitioning, every time you go to uh, three different guys, it, and they go clockwise, now those guys are also having some other stuff from other clusters. Smaller chunks, like that you can create less hot spots. And all of that is going to be um, One thing that I want to talk about also is regarding the reads. Uh, in the reads, the one thing that you end up doing is the first thing that this guy comes over, right? First thing that he's trying to do is, is try to see if we can get it in the main field. That's the first thing that he's trying to do. He says, hey, this is the main table. Awesome. This is the main table. That's great. You don't have to go with this. Just be there. If you flush it and it has his uh, tables, then it goes, it has to actually has to go to this. How does it? So you have that main table in a bunch of things. So do you need like a caching layer sometimes? Or Actually, the, the main cache, the main table, it's kind of like a cache, but not really. It's internal within the system. But yes, remember if I remember when I said that there is static tables? Those guys probably don't change that much. It's very similar to uh, the whole notion of in data warehousing, you have these leaps for domains and stats where I believe uh, if not if I'm not mistaken, the domain, they rarely change. For example. You have an employee, I'm sorry, you have a customer, EMO that's done. He lives here, right? Um, his wife is here in East Africa to be alone. All of that is there. But now there's other things, for example, all these statistics, like all the different transactions that you're doing in the bank. Those things change a lot. But the, the domain ones, they don't change a lot. So for example, he and mom still live in the same place and he's still married at the moment. It's not a deal that they're very dynamic. For those guys that they don't change that much, there's a layer that you can add in Cassandra for cash. You can do it. But as always, there's a trade. Having too much cash can actually be affected. The one thing that I keep telling people is he mentioned Redis. I think Redis is phenomenal. The only problem that you have with Redis is that it's in memory, right? And so your data can only be as big as the memory. But at the same time, it's great, especially if you're working with sessions and stuff like that. It's an amazing, amazing data. Um, what else? Did that answer your question? Yeah. So, for example, in your company, do you use like a caching layer for Cassandra? No. We, we do. We do a caching layer. We end up using what's that called again? Redis. We use Redis, but we also use another one. Memcache. Memcache. No. No. Memcache. No. Memcache. 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 Yeah. Now, now I just anyway, we do. You get it. We do. But honestly, it's because you probably you still need to get connection to Cassandra and go for that layer of cache. Whereas you know, like if you have your middle tier and you already have the caching already, you don't even have to worry. About it. One of uh, the architectural discussions that we end up having is that, like, you know, should we use Redis versus that other caching layer, which is a distributed system within the application? Caching is very hard. A lot of people that have to deal with cache, it's very hard. Because the one thing that you want to have is consistency, right? It's OK to have this caching thing, but at the same time, you have to have consistency. That's why I think Redis is a perfect example. Because you are actually treated like a database. So it's there. The only thing is that it's in memory, it's super fast. So, 
there's, there's different caching strategies that you can do. As you said, Cassandra has its own internal caching, which is this mem table, and it's really sort of isolated to Cassandra for Cassandra's own purpose. In the big picture, Cassandra is one component of a larger environment or a larger enterprise, and you're going to have lots of pieces, web servers, application servers, and depending on what the needs are of the application or, or the needs of the access patterns that you have, you can have different caching strategies. The web server itself may have different, you know, graphical assets that you want to cache somewhere and you can stick that in the C content and let me have the CDN. Or there's even actual web server level uh, caching, like Varnish is a caching tool where you can cache it right on the operating system. Uh, other pieces of data, depending on how much it changes, you can cache it in, like, you know, edge cache type data store, yeah. uh, like Memcache or, or Redis or something like that for quick availability. So there's data caching, but like you said, there's consistency issues where if the data changes in the database by some other process, something has to be smart enough in order to go push that out of the cache so the next call gets that latest version. So there's all sorts of caching strategies. There's really no silver bullet. It really comes down to best fit. What's the right fit for what you're trying to do? In that, yeah, and basically, you know, if you by the way, the library that we're using is called Hazel Cast. The other thing that we have is, uh, I, wanted, I was going to show this one. This is, it's not a big deal. The one thing that we end up using is a blue filter, which is basically based in Cassandra. And the one thing that uh, you end up doing is just to validate that, you know, it's basically an algorithm that validates that uh, if, if that guy is actually in the room. So it's a, almost like a quick algorithm to say, hey, you know, is this guy is likely to be there? So it's, yeah, or so it doesn't see. Uh, it's A17, so if you want, the one thing that I'm going to do is that I'm, I'm, going, to, uh, I'm going to stop. I would like to know if there's any, any questions out there. If there's any confusion in any of those components or concepts presented earlier, please feel free to ask. You know, it's, it's better off to ask than to walk away not knowing. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Like, if you don't use, how are you determining uh, nodes and like size of nodes versus, you know, if you have a few large nodes in your cluster or you have a bunch of small ones? Well, so I think I'll take Go ahead, please. Eric, so, so take it away. We, we actually, um, Marcelo mentioned it before, we built a logging framework to store all of these transactions that we're, that we're doing in real time. And what we did was we just started with you know, small instances on Amazon, built, built the application stack, and then just started hammering it through the equivalent of like a chaos monkey. We, we ran a load, a load test on it, and then ran a chaos monkey. So while it was running, we were killing things cleanly, abruptly, powering on nodes, powering off nodes, just to see what our throughputs were. And then from there, we got a baseline of how many transactions we can do a second. And then we just scaled it up to what we need for production. So we have uh, 14 nodes. Actually, we took out two just for spares. So we have 12 nodes, uh, six are Redis, and six are Cassandra. And they're all the same chassis type. It's a, it's a Dell 320 throwaway kind of cheap server. Uh, RAID 0, 32 or 64 gigs of RAM, I don't remember which one. So these are bare metal nodes? Just, just bare metal. So we actually have three copies. We have three data centers. Yeah. Um, data center one's a physical data center, and that's where all the majority of the writes are occurring. And then we have Amazon East and Amazon Portland that we replicate to. And like I said, we just started with something small and, and did a POC. You know, if you can do it on an Amazon small using Amazon's cloud stack, which yeah. those machines are not optimized at all. Yeah. Um, and then just, just size it and scale it. You know, we're, what was it, 10,000 inserts a second? Yeah. Or something in our, on, on that physical cluster. Now when we, when we did our full deployment to Portland and to um, East, Amazon East, we actually use, I think, extra largest because they're the closest in, in size to what we actually deployed. So when you said you had three data centers, was that one cluster spread across the three data centers, or was it three separate clusters? Three separate clusters. Three separate clusters. Yeah. Were they talking to each other yes. at all? They are. What, do, what mechanism were you using to have them Cassandra. talk? Cassandra. Just Cassandra's own replication? Cassandra's replication. Okay, cool. So within the network topology, you basically state, hey, you know, uh, the network topology for this guy, this guy is, is, for example, this cluster is means, this cluster is in West, whatever, and then you, you network the quality, you say, hey, I want replica of two, three years. Yeah, or it, figures, it figures it out. Exactly. Yeah. 
through all the, you know, like I said, those, those different protocols. There's a couple of protocols that you have. You have uh, gossip, which is the one that validates the state of every single node and it checks, checks to see, you know, the behavior of the nodes. Um, and then you have this, this other thing called snitch. And this snitch is the other protocol that is basically finding out, you know, which, which node has what, or which node has the ranking. Um, before anything, you know, the one thing that I really, really like Cassandra is also, like I said, you know, if you want fast writes, definitely Cassandra is, is something that you, that you should be looking for. Like I said, you have multi data and you can have the script. The one thing that I don't think Cassandra is, is good for is, like I said, if, it's, if there's a system where you end up having, um, you need to have high consistency. Maybe you can use Cassandra, but the one thing is, I will say that you may probably use uh, a combination of Cassandra or something else, and that's like everything else, right? You not only use one programming language, you use multiple. Same thing. Um, the other thing that I was going to say that, that I really like about Cassandra is the one thing that you end up doing the moment that you start a Cassandra node is you get all these metrics. And that is awesome. Because the one thing that you can do is you can, you can see the state of everything before they happen. And you can, you can do capacity plan, right? And if you end up having a good monitoring system, like the way that we implemented, I know that we use New Relic, but also we use like a version of Nagus. Yes. Who's using Nagus over here? Yes, yes. If you use anything like that, right, you start getting all these metrics, and you basically, you know at the time, if you need more, right, like you say, you know what, based on this trend, we need X amount of servers. Passive time. Something that is really good. The moment that you start firing up a node in Cassandra, you get stuck getting all the stats, me, max, min, all that stuff. It helps you out. And that's something that is, for me, that's great. Metrics is borderline irresponsible if you don't have metrics in your system, in my case. That is something that I'm pretty adamant about. Every time we write something, I pair up with this fine gentleman's team and we say, okay, we're measuring something. And if it gets to this threshold, you call this dude. Or you do that. Um, things like that. You need that. Um, that's something. Yeah, I've got a question for you. Before we move on to the demo, can you talk about adding and removing nodes and cluster rebalancing? I'm going to take this one. Cool. Just general concepts. Just, it's an important concept. Huh? Adding is the easy part. You basically drop in a node, set your configs on it. Right. It joins the cluster. Um, there's a command, well that's actually removing. When you add it and then it just, it auto rebalances. So removing. Before we talk about that, yeah. can you explain what rebalancing is? Yes. In general, concept level. Right. So the notion Maybe go back to that, the diagram of the ring. Yeah. Can we go back in there? 48, go back to 40, oops. Oh, ah. Yeah, it's a little bit slow on the uh, the mouse yeah. when you're going over the Wi-Fi like that. Maybe on your other screen. Well, there it is. an important enough concept to talk about. Um, I guess I can start. I give, give you while he's working on that. I can give you. A, I can just give you a concept. I can just give you a concept. So basically, let's say you had a, a, a cluster with with eight nodes in it, and each one carries a chunk of data, one subset of the data. So you've got chunk zero through seven. If you lose node node three that contains chunk three of the data, 
so that data is gone. What will happen is, as, as Marcelo mentioned earlier, Cassandra will still continue to take transactions and will write it to other nodes. The one node that happens to be handling a particular transaction makes note of which new node it put it in. And that is the hint that it says, if you come to me asking for that data, I put it over there. Now, what will happen is, if you need to, if, if, if you, you can issue a command to rebalance, or as uh, Eric said, it can auto rebalance, you add a new node. What it has to do is it takes all the data and redistributes it evenly across all the remaining nodes, or all, if you add a node, it's, it, it redistributes all the data across, so you went from eight nodes to nine. Well, that ninth node needs to get some data and make it useful, but you don't will necessarily want to just start writing new data to it. You still want to keep your data evenly distributed so all your access goes across the cluster evenly. So it literally reads a piece of data from every single cluster and to redistributes it across all of these nodes with the ninth one included. Now, that process can run while the, the cluster is being accessed, so it does it actively. Because it handles it with, with the hints concept. So let's say you take a piece of data out of node one, put it in node three, it stores a hint in node one until but, it's done. But then you know that you just added yep. to your to your ring. Yep. It's not going to receive any any replica. It, it can start files. receiving new data immediately. So it knows where it's falling in the ring, so it knows which section of that hash value, the hash range it belongs to. It will start receiving new transactions, which those can be served immediately. Any other data that it needs is either going to be restored to it from the commit log or it's going to be written to it from another node that had that piece of data while it was down. No, no, that, that's okay. I was asking you okay. mainly when you are rebalancing the nodes yep. because you added a new one, the rebalancing algorithm probably calculated the, the amount of data that that node should receive yep. based on the empty status. Yes. I imagine mean, that this is a for, in, like an extreme case, but it's, is it possible that you get an overload of that node because you it, you just put it in uh, inserted like a ton of information that needs to go into that range of, uh, of hashes. That one, that you're, there is a performance impact to rebalancing. It's a non-zero value. There is going to be a performance impact. The more nodes you have, the more distributed that impact is. Smaller cluster will start to feel it more. Yeah. So you see, generally, you don't really need huge nodes. You're actually better off with medium-sized nodes and lots of them. And that will just keep your costs down and keep Come it distributed. Hardware. Yes. Yeah. Low cost, cheap. So, no rating, no but while that is redistributing is happening, yes, there is going to be an impact, and the most impact will be felt by, on that node. But you're still serving data. You've had a, you've suffered a, a hardware loss, or you've added a new new, new node because you want to grow. And while it's redistributing, yes, there's going to be some chatter back and forth to make that happen. There is going to be an increase in writes on that one node as it starts to receive data, but that starts to level off. And as I said, the more nodes you have, the more distributed it is, the less that's felt, the less impact there is. There's something else, <clears throat> and that's something that actually a lot of clients uh, end up using. Is, like I said, Hector's Dynamics, Data Stacks. All these, all these clients, actually, like I mentioned to you before, is truly there's not a notion of a master and a slave, so you can actually put it where you know it, it will point you to where you go. But um, let me go back in, again onto the replication. I said, for example, you just, you have, let's say, for example, just two different data centers. You have Miami and then you have New York. You feel like you should add another one in California. For whatever reason, you say, for example, you want to you want to have a replication there for their security or because a lot of the clients or you, you want to, to start accessing clients from there, you don't want them all to go all the way to Miami. At that moment in time, like you mentioned, automatically, once you end up adding all those guys, the application is going to be, the concepts are start, going to start talking, and then it's start, going to start distributing the application. And like for example, when I when I spin up a new box, you know, like you mentioned, the one thing that you can do is automatic detection. So it's going to look at the cluster, and like you mentioned, this for example, 2000, you have a right? And this is something that, that's what I mentioned before, you have to end up thinking about how you're going to be reading the data. Because like I said, the partitioning, this is like the key, the row key, remember? That is something very important to have. Because that's going to be the way that you partition. So the one thing that it's going to say is like, 2000 is clearly having too much load. That's the hotspot. So this node is going to take over this guy. And now we're going to split the range. 
and then the cars are going to talk to each other, and then they have a, a long distance, and then they're, they're going to the location. Right? That doesn't, having the smaller nodes inside the cluster, that doesn't lead to a higher rank possibility of their corruption? Why data corruption? Because it's, how is that related to the size? I don't know. Well, sorry? You said that you could potentially have data corruption if you have nodes that are too small, physically too small? No, no, if that doesn't, if that doesn't increase the chances of having a data corruption. Or um, well, keep in mind that everything is immutable. So because of the fact that it's, they're immutable, um, status is changed. Yeah. Yeah. It's in a fan mm -hmm. But one of the things that Alexander has when you're setting up the cluster in the replication stack, it has this built-in concept of racks in the data center and subnets. So you can create your partition, your partitioning to create each one of these nodes, either dispersed, dispersed across the racks or dispersed across IP ranges. So in some models, you may have an IP range in rack one or an IP range in rack two based on your second octet or third octet. Or you have a physical location, like in our case, we use in our naming scheme. So it's built in standard to say, look at the naming scheme and don't put you know, two of these nodes that, that's receiving data in the same rack. So in case you lose an entire rack within the data center. So it, it supports that right out of the box. It's kind of cool. You can actually yeah. tie, your, you can tag, see that you can tag the nodes. It's just node tagging. This node is in this rack in this data center. But then it ties that tagging to the replication strategy. So you can say, I want at least two copies or three copies of this particular piece of data, but you can set it up so not all three copies of that is sitting in one data center. So in case you lose the data center, that piece of data is gone. You can at least make sure that you got one piece here, one piece there, and another one on a third node somewhere. So you, or you can say minimum two per data center and it will maintain totally at four, but you can still do that. You can spread it across racks, spread it across data centers, so you can just tag those nodes that way. And you can, it doesn't have to be physical data centers. You can tag it however you want. You can just say group A and group B and just have them physically separated on two different rows in the same data center. It just really comes down to how you decide to set it up. So the one thing that I wanted to do also is, uh, so I, I created this kind of workshop that I ended up using in uh, my, my meetup, the Miami JP meetup. Um, as I mentioned to Andrew, when I ended up doing this by myself, it took me over an hour. Um, because it's, there's, there's two pages. Uh, Are you guys ready to do the, are you heading into the live demo? Huh? You got, you're heading into the live demo? Right. Yeah. Okay, so you guys, you guys ready for the live demo or do you gonna want to take a quick five minute break? Okay, just want to make sure everyone really wanted to hit the bathroom or anything like that. Yeah. All right, cool. Bye, your breaks. Can you, uh, I'm not sure anybody can see that. Can you make that? Yeah, anything. Yeah. That's the matrix, right? Why or why have I not taken the blue pill? Oh, I asked the same question, but it's. 10 years ago, people already came over that. <laughs>
Um, the other thing that I, to, I was going to uh, say is one of the triggers that you end up using with Cassandra is that you cannot do any ad hoc queries. Um, that's a yeah. Perfect. Okay, I mentioned that. <laughs> but, yeah, you cannot do any ad hoc queries. You can't. And this is something that if you go to data stacks, not only they will tell you that, okay, you're going to use your version of, uh, uh, of Cassandra, but at the same time, they will tell you, oh, by the way, you need to get soda. And you will say, why so? It's like, well, yeah. <laughs> because like that, you can do with ad hoc queries. Bigger. Bigger. So, more? Okay. Everybody get it? Can everybody see? The notes, the notes will be available after the, on, the, on my website, but it's still good to be able to follow along. There lots of green text that you can't read. You'll start to fall asleep. <laughs> yeah. So over here, I want to start from very basic ground level. Right now, the latest data stack, um, they have, like I believe it's a 2.0. So this is the one thing that I'm, I'm using this one because it's kind of old, but basically I, I put all, basically all my notes here. Um, one of the things that I highly recommend you doing, they just go through them, and then after that, we're gonna end up using this guy just to run Santa. And you'll see this in a bit. But the one thing that you're gonna have is basically a lab. All this stuff, stuff that you can do, you cannot do, and then go into the queries. One of the things that I keep telling, I don't think we're gonna go through this whole thing today. But if you guys get stuck on anything, email for leave us, it's my Skype, Twitter, also Gmail. I will meet. Let me know. Um, so anyways, we're gonna go through it. And as I mentioned, you know the one thing that you can press on that? You can sit for right here. Huh? Is it here on the uh, Apple TV? As you said, you want to sit. So, <laughs> so here, uh, just really quick. Can we uh, can we maximize the window and zoom in a little bit? Wait. Yeah. 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 Here we go. So um, as you can imagine, here, big Cassandra is going to start, and you know, I mean, I'm sorry, it's going to start Cassandra. The end basically it's going to spit out all the debugging into another screen. So let me get this guy. Are we actually going to run a cluster or are we going to run single node? A single node. Single node, okay. We're going to run a single node. Yeah. Then we'll go on. Just a single node. <coughs> so. So can you quickly explain what you have set up? I know you're working on your yes. Mac, but what do you, right. what's actually running on the machine? Does anyone use this paper here? Yes. For, for, for those guys, paper is, is just an amazing freaking tool that I just, I, I don't know. How would you describe it, Eric? For me, it's just the like virtual it's machine. Up virtual machines like right on the spot. You know, like we don't have to Go ahead and create a virtual machine from, you know, like with all the bells and whistles. You just want to create a central as nothing more like looking at a server. You don't want to have like a display screen or anything like that. You just want a vanilla central web server. And then I want to SSH it from paper. It's awesome, right? Everyone's familiar with virtualization, right? All right. So basically, it's a virtual machine, for, it's a virtual, virtual host hypervisor, so you can run a virtual. Room host inside of your computer. There's other software, VMware and whatnot. Vagrant is very, very lightweight, so you can run a computer, another computer inside your computer without taking another ton of overhead. 
Um, you still have the overhead of the other operating system running, so it's not like extremely fast like on a laptop, but when you're running in a cloud environment, you can use Vagrant to spin up machines almost dynamically with very, very little overhead. Yeah. So here, let me go ahead and the one thing that I'm going to end up using is the Cassandra CLI. So here, I'm going to go to my Cassandra directory. And then after that, I'm going to start my This one is the one that we're going to use, SQL, um, SQL SH. And that's the one that we end up going to interact with Sandra, just like we're doing now. Um, so at this point in the other window, when you ran that first command, Cassandra is up and running. Right. And so now this window, you're just connecting to it to query. Exactly. So that right now, we have Cassandra running. We have like a bunch of stuff going on. Now, we're in the Cassandra cluster. So in here, as, as I mentioned to you before, I can connect to any one of the nodes. And I can say, hey, you know, I'm going to use this key, key space. And after that, uh, I can say, uh, all right, I can um, the one thing that you can do is that, for example, here I have uh, a select for customer purchases. And this is exactly how we had before. You know, like this is, this is just like, this is just a SQL, in essence. So the key space is essentially, if we were to translate this to our relational database, key space is the database. It's the database. And then customer purchases, that's the common family, right? That's right. Okay. Yeah, so the common family, as he mentioned, it will be our table. Make sense? Well, what were you saying before they couldn't query directly? Oh, no, they can. So I, imagine that you have a cluster of like 50 nodes. You can connect to any one of these guys and then say, you know, end up doing select from customer purchases, and then it will go to the entire cluster and find out, okay, guys, you need to bring me this data. Um, one really quick thing is when you do end up, you know, this queue is big data, so when you select start, you can probably get four records, but potentially you can have like a million records. So the one thing that you end up doing is that this has this guy has almost has a limit. So the one thing that you have to do when if you're using an application, the one thing that you do is basically you do almost similar to that pagination. You have, you have to paginate through all these guys because it will say, dude, you know this. Um, the way that getting into the internals is actually like, you know, the way that Drift ends up working is almost like you end up doing it with MySQL where you have buffer sizes because this guy has to fetch something for all these nodes but he needs to put it in memory and then display it to the client and so you know if you end up having a huge amount of load which you have no idea the moment that you end up doing select start you can get a million rows so like I said there's a limit I forgot how much to limit but just so you know that's something that happened to me that I was like I know that there's no data that would happen so for a query that you run it's transparent like you will still run a select start from customer purchases it would go and you would see the, you would see the, the exact, exact same representation we were seeing here, even if you have a thousand nodes. Exactly. Yeah. But I, I thought you said that you would keep, we couldn't query. There's, there's, there's a solid. Yeah, there's a, there's a part that you can, there's a limit. Uh, so for example, like, okay, like I mentioned, they said you have a million uh, records in there. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there's a limit of, like, I think it's over a thousand or something like that. Right, and so then you have to set the limits, so like give me a thousand to two thousand, stuff like that, like by the end. But uh, I, I, I locked myself on, on the solar thing. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, imagine, imagine we want to do, imagine we do, want to do ad hoc queries. Sorry? Imagine that you want to do some type of ad hoc queries. Ad hoc queries can be probably like you want to end up finding out the marketing team comes in and you, they say, dude, we want to know about any type of apps, right? We want to know any type of application. Yeah, so I have like, you know, we want to know all this stuff. That's where Cassandra makes a hard line and says, we are not going to do that. 
We're not going to do that. If you want a, a full distributed system, if you want to have data replication, you come to us. You want to have you want, you want to have ad hoc queries, you need to go somewhere else. So you can get an output of the columns, but you can't necessarily query. You can't run specific things that the marketing team might be asking for. Exactly. Exactly. So things like, for example, aggregations, right? Functions. Um, there's a few. There's a few of them, but not to the extent of doing some type of, uh, like I said, any type of facets. You just run it against so. So yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's what I mean to say. You know, usually what you do is you get this guy as your main storage, right? Because it's replicated, it's distributed you know that everything is fine. And then you end up using tools like Solar, or in our case, it's Elasticsearch. Anyone using Elasticsearch? This guy is awesome. No wonder his name is Marcel. <laughs> I, to, I just love you, that awesome. Oh, yes. <laughs> I need it back to work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you look at one of the queries to just the node you're on, or a specific node, or it has to just go through all of them? Right, no. It doesn't work like that. Like you, you can if you know the ranges. You're not really saying limit to this node, you're saying yeah, right. to this key range. I, I, because the figure's gonna end up there anyway, but you have to know what that range is. And in all reality, just because it was that range today, it could be a different range tomorrow because they added a node and rebalance. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not something you generally care to do to limit to one node because the data is a database transaction, it's a database engine. You think all the nodes is just nothing but storage, and you're asking the database engine to give you data. In reality, you don't care where it's stored, you just want some data. Back. Right. And out of curiosity, what would you like to you know, like, like say, I want to query only for this, this node? Well, I was just curious if there was an app, for example, ah. that, that maybe, I don't know, some sort of. Uh, I was just curious. I was just, what am I thinking of? Because uh, I used to, when I worked healthcare a while back, claims. For example, and it may be, you know, different nodes stored by month. So you have 12 nodes. It's just the way the app is written, maybe. I'm sure it's not real world. Mm -hmm. And I'm uh, thinking of an app that we had on top of the mid 90s, uh, where the way the, data, the database works is instead of having like a full database, you can partition it into multiple hash files, and then it would query them. So what we do to speed up, rather than searching through all of them, we say, well, we're only interested in the claims that were processed in July, so let's just hit partition number seven. You this particular case, July, we're yeah. Yeah. yeah, that imagine, yeah. imagine that that. Um, let's see if this this will work. There. Here's here's the best way to think about it, and you think of it in terms of something super familiar, Facebook, right? Facebook, you have essentially one big time period, which is your timeline. And what Cassandra, you can do, actually Cassandra started it at Facebook before it spun off. And what they, what they would do is they would basically make one column is a day. So basically a day, it's kind of hard because the column, the word column is used in multiple databases. In this particular case, the column is just basically a slice of data grouped together by something. In this case, it's called a day. In that day, you can have additional values, which could be a post, a picture, uh, you know, a video, whatever. Once the next day rolls around, that becomes a new column. So when you want to search, they give me everything that happened in my timeline, you just go to that one row for that user and pull everything up to whatever timeline you want, group it. Or you can say, show me everything for today across all my people I'm following. You get a list of followers, and then you get that column for each one of those people. I understand the data model. Okay. I've been working with a similar data model for 20 years. So okay. Yeah. I get the data model. All right, all right. I'm just curious about the physical aspect of sure. different nodes. For that. Okay. Yeah, maybe. What are the actual posts? So, if you continue the model of Facebook, what are the actual posts considered? So, the posts would be considered. So, you could have. Uh, they got rid of the concept now, but really, really, the day could be a super column, and then inside of that, you can have columns. But you, you could have just have values now. So, the value could be a string of text, which is your post. So, the column. But, the but then you want to have on each post the actual <coughs> uh, everything that's happening to that post. Yes. Well, you could have essentially just more attributes in there. Uh, and those could just be pointers to some other data source themselves. Okay. Maybe uh, uh, oops, sorry. That data is one of one comments, but is this a object relational database? Like I can store directly an entire object 
No. You can. I mean, you can put text in there if you want to put JSON. Cassandra yeah, doesn't uh, care. Uh, you yeah, don't yeah, take yeah, JSON. It'll but it won't treat it like a JSON document. Oh, it's not as JSON document. Well, that's not even better. It's more powerful. It's not a document base. It's actually a key value. Yeah. But I can I can query the deepest key possible in any moment. So, case Facebook, I can query using Cassandra to get an image from the day, from a post, from a person. If you have it indexed that way, as you said, you only get one index, but you do have secondary indexes. Yeah, yeah, you, and you build it the way. You have to know ahead of time that's what you're looking for, and you pre-create that materialized view, so that way it's there and ready. So it's like, like he said, ad hoc is not really that great. But if you know ahead of time that's an access pattern that will be common, you create a materialized view, and as data is, is entered into the database, it puts it in the primary store, and then also updates all the materialized views. So when you go to, it's like big, big stored index. Mm -hmm. So when you go to query, if you will know want that particular access pattern, it hits the materialized view. Oh, so in case of Facebook, then you got, in case of the YouTube example, sorry, yeah. like, mm -hmm. you will get, when you query for a day, that it would be the usual, Mm -hmm. You cannot query for something specifically stored inside of that column. You can if you if do it ahead was, of time. If it was considered yeah. before before time using the material like yeah. or whatever. But ad hoc if just off the top of your yeah, head. Yeah, like, oh, you, yeah, you, you, you can. Just don't expect it to come back anytime soon if you have a very big oh, yeah, set of data. I mean, it will run. You, it's just it won't be that fast. It'll you'll have to write something that digs through every single value, and then as those results come back, you have to parse it looking for the value that you need. Yeah. So the materialized view will give you that ability to hit that one piece of data. If it's but gen, but that's very costly. You, it, when you build a materialized view like that, you're essentially building a whole other collection of data. Yeah. It requires more disk space, more CPU power, things like that. If it, for ad hoc, you generally don't do that. You know, if it's something that's normally done on a regular basis, it's part of your design, then you know that cost is considered. And also keep in mind that now you have this sense of duplication. That was in a way, if you need to update one thing, now you also need to update the material. Yeah, to more and so right. Yeah. yeah. But again, that's something that you have a trade-off with Cassandra. You say, hey, you know what? I don't care about this space. This space is not my problem, right? He, I'm here to give you high availability, fast writes, and potentially five fast reads. Um, I, I want to go back on that notion that you mentioned, George, because there was the one thing that I was thinking of is basically, I, I automatically started thinking about the data model. Like you mentioned that you have all these different policies of insurance companies. Say, for example, you and I work in that insurance company, and then you say, look, I want to store all those policies, but eventually I would like to query them depending by the month, and also depending by the type, different type of policies, right? So in your data model, the, the row key, the primary key, has to be a composite key. And the composite key is probably going to be the month, and then it's going to be the type. And so like that every time you go to a particular, uh, when you, it will be oblivious to you, but through the system, Everything will be partitioned according to the, to right. the based on the month. Right, exactly, based on the month and the time. Yeah, it's similar to the database I work with. It's completely, I work with multi value databases. Ah, that's nice. Sweet. Sweet. That's this is my cool. first time, honestly. Like, I, everyone says Mongo. Um, for, for us, there was a guy that, that for, for me, he just became an automatic and my best friend, who's no longer with us, Oliver. Um, he was the one that ended up talking to me about this and it, it was just one of those guys that you squeeze on and just stats come out of him. And um, he basically was the one that told me like look at the dynamic paper, look at Cassandra, and basically I pair up with him and just became my best friend, which is he didn't know. And he was the one that taught me all that. So for me this is the first time. But the one thing that I really like is the notion of like you don't even have to worry about the moment that you end up select start from policies where month is July and um, the policy type is like insurance. You know, you don't have to worry about where to go. Is that like the two is, is the data that you store, is it typed? Like, can you say, oh, I'm going to store money value or just. Oh, yes, yes. yes. You can. There's a, there, there are certain types, as he mentioned. You can have decimals, you can have UUIDs, you can have UUID times because the UUID can be a type one. Um, you can have longs, you, you, you have different things, you know. And as I mentioned, you can put like raw text. 
Um, so yes, you can put binary tags and use overlap. Keep in mind that the poster child for this guy is Netflix. Right? So take it for what it's worth. Netflix use that um, all the time. Like that's once we end up going to um, Strata. Um, I love that company. So every time I go over there, I try to talk to the Netflix guys just because what they build is just really cool. We use a lot of the stuff that they use, a lot of the open source. Chaos Monkey, uh, they use a lot of Cassandra. So we are not using their uh, their drivers. We're using the data stack drivers along with Spring because we are, we are a Java shop. Um, but they, they have a lot of very good things on Cassandra. And as I mentioned, that is that is their their distributed system. That one, S3 for them, according to what I understand, S3 for them is their data warehouse, and Cassandra is like the main data warehouse, along with some other ones. It's 56. I'm not going to do the time. How much do you have of the actual demonstration? Oh, I, I, I have a lot. Can you can you give go over the high level overview of create, insert, delete? Sure. The, so, like I said, guys, um, the one thing that I do, I, I made it so it would be like a workshop, um, and I'm going to keep all of this stuff to Andrew. Um, it's up to you guys. I mean, I'm going to give you, uh, give you this, guys. And here is basically a tutorial from zero to here. Like, I have all this stuff, do this stuff. This is the application. This is where you configure this stuff. Do this, do that. If you guys, I love this stuff. I really sound like this type of stuff. So if you have any questions, um, just shoot me an email. Or just look at me on Twitter um, or in Skype, like I said. Um, but right, so let me just go through this really, really quick. Over here, as you can tell, you know, this is how I'm making, making a table over here. Um, we talked about, and this is something that maybe I need to be more specific because it's, I kind of struggle. The difference between compound keys and composite keys. Um, the, so the primary key we know that is the, the row key. That is going to be the way that is going to partition. Right? And the best way that I can tell you is that this is a compound key. If I would have like two, uh, if, would, if, if this is, for example, if this guy will have, actually I have it somewhere else, I'll show you. But in here, this is a composite key. Um, so this is a compound key. So in here, the primary key, as you notice, there's two, but actually the, uh, the day will be the one that it will be the, the partition, right? And well, now you can be able to do uh, query using also time. Um, and that is something that is kind of kind of interesting to see because let me see if I can have it here or in the other one. Um, because over here, we're pretty much the, in, the, in the second one is where I am using a uh, composite. We 
have a, a notion of a, a program, and a program is just imagined as a campaign, marketing campaign. So in here, you know, um, don't worry too much about the names, but this guy is basically what we call a static column, right? So I don't care if it's the ID carrier, right? Over here, as you can imagine, the partition is going to be based on the ID. But this is going to be relatively small. Because of the fact that this is almost like a configuration, I'm going to have like a maybe 20, at most 30 programs, but not that many. But now, half this other guy is called transactions. And transactions is all the different chatting that is going to happen between these two systems. And I'm going to go back and forth and you know I'm carrying all this stuff. So the one thing is like I said, I want to make sure that this is uniform. And this is the difference between compound keys and composite keys. And here, if you notice, I'm using the telephone number and the day create. And that is the difference of the composite keys. Now my row key is actually these two guys. So now my partition is going to be the MD as well as uh, they create. It's just the difference, as I mentioned to you, where we want to make sure that the partition is, you know, the month, and then the policy type, that's what we do, do, do something like that. And in here, it's more like I said, it's like time series. Because now, you're, you're slicing, this you're distributing everything in this ring, but according to, the, to a particular time. So your July's will be here, and all your March along with the different uh, types of policies. Um, the insert, the one thing that I mentioned to you, like insert creates basically the same thing as using SQL. Um, the biggest thing that I have is, like I said, that the path of grouping and stuff like that. Um, I highly recommend to use Elasticsearch. If you haven't used it, give it a shot. It's a great technology. I, I like it better than, than anything that's out there, including so um, so, so that's it. What do you think, Andrew? Is that correct? You, yeah, um, on the quick question on, on deleting data, yes. when you delete a row, you said it puts a tombstone, which is really nothing but a flag. It's like a soft right. delete. That's it. You flag it saying this is deleted. Similar. What about expiring data? When does that actually push it out, if ever? Right. That one is, uh, if you have any expiring data, when you mean, you mean to say, like, if you set the tombstone, right, when you actually delete that, is that what you mean? Well, so there's there's two parts to that. You can actually have expiring data, which once it's expired, then oh, it's like deleted. Yes, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing, if if you if a row is deleted and it's just it puts a tombstone there, it's still taking up physical space. And, but you know you'll never go back to that. You'll never undelete. It, you'll never create a new version of it. Is there any sort of, of garbage collection or vacuum or compaction that you yes. can do to get rid of it? And yes. like, how expensive is that operation? It is expensive. If you, it, like I said. Like you mentioned, that's a really good point. Um, compaction happens over time. You know, eventually, uh, as I mentioned to you, you know, if this, uh, just imagine every time you end up doing a read, or you end up doing a write, you go through this meta table, and then eventually, you go to, if the meta table gets full, you just basically flush and puts it into, into the SS table. And during compaction, is where you start deleting stuff, like for example, in the tombstone. Um, there's a tool called a uh, node tool, and this node tool you can actually connect to a particular node, and then you can say, like, hmm, you know what? I really want to do uh, compression. The moment that you end up doing something like that, you end up taking a toll on the system. Especially if there's a couple of types that you end up uh, doing, forgetting which ones, um, but you end up affecting. There's there's a price that you pay. So what about expiring data? Like actual setting a TTL or time to live on a piece of data and yeah. then Cassandra will automatically expire. Yeah, that one I haven't played with that. Okay. The other two. But I do know that it's very similar to like Elasticsearch, that you end up putting a time to live and eventually I think, I'm not really sure if it sets tombstone or, or if it deletes it. It's actually, what happens is the TTL is set, it's like a timestamp internally. It's usually some future timestamp you say, this has got a TTL of five days, so it automatically calculates that five days, and internally it puts a timestamp. After that, really nothing happens to it, except for at query time, when the next time you go to look at it again, 
it looks at it and goes, oh, oh. that's expired, and that's when it puts the tombstone in. Okay. So that's right. So it, there's really no need to put it there until the first time you get to touch it. Gotcha. Anything else would just be extra I.O. Nice. Nice. Um, can you modify the key once you create it and put that in? Or? You could, but it, it's, you can alter it. You can alter the table. But you really need to think about it. <laughs> it's not something that you will have to do lightly. So you can imagine. That's why, for example, in this stuff, this is our second day that we're going with my boy Julio Chocho and the rest of the team because, um, like I said, it's something that um, is going to drive. Yes, exactly. And this is, to me, this is the hardest part because the moment that sometimes you, you have no idea how you're going to query the data. Um, and this is, in this case, we're actually refactoring a current application that we have. So it's kind of easy because we already know how we're going to read the data. But imagine if you started from a green project. I'm freaking cool. What is going to look like? I don't know. It change tomorrow. Um, that is tricky for me. I haven't come across to like a green project like that. Um, except with the locking framework. And the locking framework, we knew. It, you know, by default, you knew that there's going to be some time series in there. Because it was impossible for us to just store everything in the IVRs or everything that is happening in SMS and use that as partition. We knew, like, for example, if there's a locking mechanism that you're doing in there, you're going to partition that according to a time series. But, you know, for us, it's been hard. Like I said, we know already the query. But there's been, you know, a back and forth stuff that we have. All right, cool. Anybody have any other questions on anything that was presented or any other information that they think they want to get out of this? No question. I don't know if that's your use case, but um, do you just use like traditional uh, load balancer to spread, spread uh, requests, rewrite requests across your nodes? Actually, no. You, you, you're saying like if you want to connect, right? Yeah, like if you have like a bunch of API servers that are hitting your Sandra, you can't connect to one. Yeah, right? I mean, um, in essence, you can end up creating uh, some type of cluster, I'm sorry, some type of load balancer to manage that. In reality, the one thing that you end up doing is um, the actual clients end up doing that for you, and they end up doing a little bit more. They have like sort of like the internal state. So in other words, they don't, remember that I mentioned to you that any client can go through any node, and then the nodes will know like, oh, you need to go over there. Um, clients, like for example, you know, data stacks and Styanx, Hector, um, they actually do that for you. They just sort of like, they don't get like an arbitrary uh, note. They just say, oh, dude, you need to go here. But yeah, where is that here? Where are they going to? Are they going to a virtual IP that represents the entire cluster? No, they actually go to the actual the shard, that, that actual node that so they, things that they do. They pick one arbitrarily, they say, start here. Yeah, I'm going to connect to E000. So I connect to that node, and then re receiving back from E000, it's going to give me state of all the other nodes, exactly. and my next connection may go to 4000. Right. But what happens if that first connection I try to make in E000 is not there? If that connection... If, if the node's it's gone. gone. It, it died last week, we killed it, we pulled it out of the, out of the loop, we rebalanced. Now the applications, all the applications are set to point to E00 as a starting point, but that node's not there anymore. Yeah. If that's the case, then you go with the uh, replication. You find, you'll say, they said, for example, if you, you're, you're saying if you want to read? No, no, if, if we just want to connect. Just side. to connect to the cluster, we start with one node, we connect to, say, we connect to 000, oh. that comes back with state. Here's your list of nodes, yep. and we can round robin through those. Yeah. Now, the next time I connect, the next time I reboot the application, yep. it's going to start with 000 again, oh, yeah. so give me state. The 000 was removed last time because I had a bad hard drive and we balanced. That node is gone. Yeah. What does the application do now? Where does it go? That one, you know, most likely it's just going to pick an arbitrary uh, node. How does it? How does the app the client know that? Oh, well, so the, the one thing that I know, for example, in, in, the, in, for example, in the Tapo in Hector, it will, it will get the state. Right, it will sort of like get the topology of the system and will say, okay, this is how they are. But if, uh, so it will say, okay, I gotta go to the range zero. But if range zero is not there, that one I'm not really sure, but if I'm not mistaken, he's just gonna say, look, just pick whichever, and then they're gonna tell us where to go. So, yeah, but so 
initially, the application needs to be aware of at least more than one node. Yes. So you should have multiple connections set up. It, Realistically, wouldn't it make sense to set up a load balancer, just point to the load balancer, and the load balancer will have at least the majority of the nodes set up, so you have multiple options to pick from, and the load balancer itself will act as a client and get back that state with the rest of the nodes. Yeah. I'm not but that, that doesn't make the application vulnerable to that if the load balancer is down, you've lost. You, you, oh, you, you can round robin across multiple load balancers, which I've done that. I can load. I can round robin across multiple load balancers. Oh yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Just yeah. A lot of people are doing that, but the one thing that I notice is like the client, um, you get a sense of performance because you already know the state of the or not the state. I guess you know the topology. It's almost like you have your little, you li you have a sense of your little, um, your little gossip within within the client. Yeah, but you have to have a starting point somewhere. You have to connect to something. Okay. Yeah. And you may not know, you don't want to actually go by physical name because no. physical names change. So you don't want to go to node one. Yeah. Node one may not be there tomorrow. Or so you theoretically, know. you should be going to some non-changing location like a yeah. virtual IP or something like that. And then behind that, you can hide where that's being pointed to. Yeah, but yeah. the one thing DNS work yeah. in that sense. So one thing that you also is a load balancer. What's that? Round robin DNS. Yes, as long as your DNS is low. Yeah. <laughs> The one thing that also I remember, and again, I'm, I'm probably, um, that one I probably have to look at a little bit more, but the other thing that you get the benefit from, from the client is you have a little bit more smart, like, so for example, if you want to, it, it knows the sense of like, hey, you know what, I have different data centers. Um, I should connect to the East Coast, I'm not gonna go to the West Coast because I'm gonna add latency. Uh, things like that you also have within the client. Right, okay. All right, cool. Good question. Any other questions? Anything else? Well, what would be the best way to, um, I guess, replicate data or I should say duplicate data in order to get like a test server or a QA, just, just have another database to, to develop against, not your production? What, what would be the best way to, to do that? You, you mean to start a cluster? To clone the cluster. You, you, you already know, but I don't know. You need to create a, a, a small test environment. 